I'm going to uh, mainly uh, give you a quick overview of uh, whatever it was, six hours of technical talks yesterday, just with a few highlights of uh, these because they were such good talks, and I think it really indicated the continued importance of uh, federal funding for long-term research in universities. It's something the private sector can't do. Uh, it's something that industry and um, the Defense Department and others totally depend on. Uh, in California, we've got this uh, new initiative that the governor uh, and the legislature put forth to create four um, multidisciplinary, multi-campus uh, institutes for science and innovation. We're one of them, the California Institute for uh, Telecommunication Information Technology, Cal IT Squared. And we're focused on the future of the internet. What is the internet going to evolve in to over the next five to 10 years, and how will that impact the environment, uh, intelligent transportation, medicine, and so forth? Uh, the 200 faculty working together between UCSD and Irvine, together with about 50 industrial partners. This is a great experiment. We'll see if it works. It'll have some things that'll work, some things won't work. But the whole notion of bringing together uh, professors uh, students, staff, industry, taking the component technologies and integrating them into large living laboratories and standing those up out in the real world is what is very different about this. Um, in almost everything we're doing, the notion of the internet empowering these new sensor nets is a component of it. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is to build kind of a layered universal set of technologies that can be customized to the different needs, whether it's homeland defense, environmental monitoring for science, uh, or uh, traffic. Uh, these, as you've heard, are the components of a sensor net. It's not just the sensor, it's the sensor platform, it's the telecommunications, and most importantly, it's all the software and data systems that go into it. Um, yesterday, we heard from uh, Mike Saylor in the chemistry department about how to use some incredible technologies that are uh, nanostructured that, that allow for both the photonic structure uh, of material, of new ways of using silicon to uh, create uh, incredibly sensitive and rapid uh, response materials. He showed an example uh, of one of these devices. Uh, these things, uh, although they have state-of-the-art uh, technologies in the sensor, the sensor is embedded in a manufacturable silicon so that it can be very low cost uh, and reproduced. Um, things like nanowires, a new form of uh, silicon in a poly uh, form in which you then wrap it, as he says, with grease. Those are grease molecules, I think, technically, he says. Um, that. Uh, actually uh, can be then tuned, in this case, sensitive to TNT. Uh, there's a subway ticket up there. Uh, one person that touched it on the left did not have TNT before they bought the subway ticket. Uh, the other one had been obviously doing something, and when you put the polysilicate uh, over it, you see it um, um, fluoresces under um, black light. Uh, so the notion of being able to tune to a whole wide variety of chemicals uh, and then have these things being able to be put in everyday devices is, is one of the uh, interesting approaches. Uh, he said, and this is, I think, a good example, I'm a chemist, um, I live in the lab, it never would have occurred to me to try to take this stuff out and put it uh, in a device with wireless technologies and then put it in, out in northeast San Diego <coughs> County in the Santa Margarita Ecological Preserve uh, except for having this new collaborative framework that Cal IT Squared brings to the uh, uh, faculty. Uh, furthermore, we're finding that companies like Graviton, a startup in San Diego that creates these sensor platforms, they're, they've said, well, gee, you know, we'll partner with you, and that just you know, shortcuts all of that that we would have to do in academia. Furthermore, then, that strengthens uh, the products coming uh, into the private sector, which means it can be dispersed uh, widely and quickly. Industry has been very supportive uh, of this new kind of partnership. Um, we had some 40 first year graduate student uh, fellows fully funded by industry at just UCSD alone. This is one of them, Jamie Link, uh, who's uh, getting a PhD. Uh, she's uh, holding uh, the device that you saw earlier I mentioned, but now it's got a wireless device, a wireless link on it 
they're putting it on balloons and they're linking it into the uh, Santa Margarita Ecological Reserve uh, as a test bed. But we tend to think, I think, of sensors as being chemical, uh, mechanical, physical. The imaging world is radically being changed. I have to say I didn't really appreciate just how radical the changes were until our good colleagues up at Irvine uh, sent down uh, Stuart Kleinfelder, a professor who they just hired actually uh, last year, uh, to talk about what can happen when you go into a uh, pixel uh, array uh, on uh, silicon and you say, begin to think about having a thousand transistors per pixel. And when you, for instance, put an A to D converter uh, under uh, analog to digital converter under each pixel instead of out of the whole array, uh, well, these are the kind of things that can happen. Uh, it's just extraordinary. I mean, 100,000 frames a second, uh, a terabyte of data per second being produced by these devices um, in many different wavelength characteristics and so forth. This is a whole new world. I used to say that, that the reason that we were moving from sort of a computing focus to a data focus was that the experimentalist instruments and the observer's instruments were getting onto Moore's law. This is way more radical than getting onto Moore's law. This is exponentially faster by a lot uh, because you're going in and designing in to these devices whole new approaches. For instance, here in the Brookhaven heavy ion uh, collider, uh, being able to put in something that's got 100 million pixels and being able to get data coming out at uh, gigab uh, gigabytes a second uh, is all because of, a, it's not like off the shelf, it's taking that technology now, let's make a special purpose uh, device that can, for instance, in 3D, uh, look at, uh, this is a gold on gold collision, then these are all particle tracks coming out of that collision. Uh, it has to be looked at in 3D and at very high rate. And so he was able to customize these technologies to that particular science experiment. Large science experiments, the shared facilities that NSF is going to spend billions of dollars in capital money on over the next few years, all require this kind of deep information technology and telecommunications to work at all. And this is a huge change for science. We're going, the only approach that was going to work is a collaborative approach between computer scientists and the uh, disciplinary scientist. It's no longer an option, it's a requirement. Uh, if you look at uh, the fantastic work that's going up uh, at Berkeley and our sister institute called Citrus, um, we were able to get uh, Chris uh, Pister down here to talk a little bit about this smart dust. Um, this is DARPA-funded work that originally had the idea of putting a bunch of sensors into something the size of a cubic uh, millimeter. Now, you can see that the first versions of it were more like centimeters, uh, but as a result of that, it drove the, the uh, understanding of the system integration. Um, and then people like Dave Culler got interested and said, well, I'll just write an operating system, uh, which is tiny uh, by normal, character, uh, normal thinking, um, put uh, it into this, and then put software into thinking about the power control throughout the system. Uh, this is really radical stuff. And uh, where they're going... Uh, in the next rev is shown here on their penny. Now, um, what Chris was saying, this is actually a meter-sized penny. <laughs> now, that's a real penny, and if you look at it, here is the device, and that little horizontal line that you see down here uh, is one millimeter, one millimeter, okay? And yet, there's a CMOS IC in it. This is a laser corner reflector. You see there's solar cells. They can just sort of plug in everywhere here. Uh, uh, and so forth. Um, so this, this notion of actually uh, constructing uh, smart sensors with embedded processors, uh, but uh, so small that they're effectively disposable, this thing has 16 cubic millimeters uh, if you sort of add it all up. The total actual volume is about down to five, so they're getting very close to their millimeter cubed um, uh, plan. And, and you, know, you have optical coming in, it goes to the receivers and so forth, uh, all kinds of smart intelligence over to the sensors and back out again and using solar power. Now, as Deborah said, there, 
you, you have to think about the topology of the networks, and there are a variety of kinds of ways you might think about deploying these sensors. Uh, for instance, if you're looking at things that are themselves linear, like telecommunications lines, pipelines, water systems, then having concentrators going into these wireless distributed sensors uh, and then sort of having them string on along the way, that's a linear approach. There may be, a, more appropriately, a hierarchical approach where you have something like power substations, manufacturing plants, in which you have a lot of things that have to get figured out. And then the idea of the hierarchy is you want to keep the um, power down as much as, ever, as possible, and so you just want the things to call to their nearest neighbor, and then eventually you get something that's more powerful uh, and has more uh, energy, and it can call home. Uh, but these ad hoc meshes, I think, are really the future, and Deborah has been a real pioneer in this. Uh, I think that this is the sort of thing where eventually throughout, whether it's our automobiles as they pass each other exchanging information, it's out in the environment, this sort of area is really important. There's a tremendous amount of computer science just in how you handle these, uh, the software layers that sit over these things to make them work. It's not just the technology itself of the sensors. Uh, Ramesh Rao, who's a uh, former director of the Center for Wireless Communications at San Diego and is the campus director for Cal IT Squared, uh, has been thinking a lot about the design of the systems as a whole. When you talk about these sensor nets, you can't just optimize the sensor or the radio uh, or the software. It, it, those are trade-offs. You have to think of this as a system, and that means you have to make a discipline of uh, system-oriented uh, trade-offs, uh, energy for location, communication for computing, um, energy for awareness. That is, if these little, cre uh, little sensors know where they are, then they can say, well, if this one will do something now, I'll sleep for a minute, and then it'll wake up, and I'll, you know, and so on. So they trade these things off and across themselves. Um, I must say that this is one of the big challenges for academia. For whatever reason, I've noticed for most of my adult life uh, in academia that systems is just something academics don't do much. They don't hire, they don't promote, they don't respect, I think, at the level they need to, uh, because we've had this very reductionist, tear it all apart and then study, you know, like the DNA or the protein or something rather than the animal. And, 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 and now things are moving back as we've learned so much during the last hundred years and we're starting to pull it all back together into systems. But when we look around, just like in security, for the researchers doing the deep thinking here, there aren't anywhere near enough of them. Then there's just wonderful innovations going on in the uh, wireless itself. Um, here at the San Diego Supercomputer Center, Hans Werner Braun, who made fundamental uh, contributions to the wired internet when it was first being developed, got an NSF grant uh, with Frank Vernon at SIO to, to put uh, 45 megabit a second line of sight uh, wireless uh, internet all over Southern California, enabling a whole bunch of scientific projects that John Orcott will be talking about uh, a little bit later. Um, and so we're able to come along now later with Cal IT Squared and build on top of this uh, work. Um, uh, in addition to that was the unlicensed band the FCC has. We're, we're in the midst of beginning to roll out commercially this whole third generation of cellular telephones where your telephone not only has digital voice, but now has digital internet always on. And the projections, it's a controversial issue as to how the market will roll this out, but uh, certainly it looks like that over the next three to five years, as many new endpoints to the internet will come on through the mobile wireless internet as it took us 30 years to develop in the uh, exponential growth of the wired internet. And in fact, I believe by 2010, when you say you're on the internet, you'll assume that that means that you're wireless and mobile, and there'll be these archaic things in houses and offices where you have to go in and look through a glowing screen uh, fixed to your desk, and, and inside is the internet. Uh, that'll be considered sort of like caves. Um, so one of the things that we're doing, Cal IT Squared, about half of the 200 folks are either uh, faculty or either in computer science or electrical engineering. And so we're looking at all of the layers that are gonna have to be uh, developed and integrated that sit above the wireless infrastructure and the sensors and all the hardware that deal with real-time services, power control, geolocation. That is such a wild thing when everybody knows 
where they are. All your cell phones are going to have to know where they are to within 20 feet or something within two years by law. So when you punch 911, they know where to send the ambulance. Well, if everybody's cell phone knows where they are and you're in an environment where you're allowing other people to know where your location, and all of a sudden you have spatial buddies that show up on your maps and not just, you know, uh, on your instant messaging. How many of you use instant messaging, by the way, on a regular basis? Okay. All the kids do. Okay. <laughs> and, and this is one of the problems. Um, <laughs> We'll just let that sit. Um, the, as, as I think Deborah said yesterday, the thing that just came out again and again and again in every talk is one of the real revolutions is that if software permeates every piece of these devices, then a whole new world of power awareness becomes possible. The batteries are the limiting factor in all these things. And you know, we're used to the cell phones because the working because every night when I go home, before I do anything, before I brush my teeth, before I get in bed, I must maintain my batteries. Okay? That is the first thing I do. And I have to go make sure all my little devices are, are pos you know, plugged in and are sucking up juice from the power current. So the next day they got nice hunky batteries to run all these circuits. Well, you can't do that every night out in the environment, right? And, and so all the circuits have assumed they're going to have powerful batteries driving them. That's just not right. So all the circuits have got to be redone as uh, to, to assume that you only, you only call for an electron when you really, really need it in any part of the circuit, whether it's the radio, whether it's the amplifiers, the, the microprocessors, whatever. And so that's a good example here is Rajesh Gupta's work up at Irvine in which power awareness gets at every level of the operating system. Power aware APIs are at the very top of the stack. This stuff is going to really change everything. Finally, no, the sensors are only there for the purpose of generating data. Right? They don't do anything other than generate data. So the human comes into the loop when they try to then look at the data. And so the data stack, the, the software that goes into um, both archiving the data, uh, creating knowledge warehouses, then being able to go in and, and federate across uh, stovepipe data systems with all different kinds of <clears throat> legacy um, uh, formats, allowing then finally to go in with these very complex um, data mining tools, very powerful artificial intelligence techniques that are being developed and then to visualize it. And this is, uh, I think, a really radical change. The nice thing is that what we're seeing is that this, which is needed for all the wired internet work, uh, where the San Diego Supercomputer Center that Chaitan Baru is at, uh, is the person who's created all this, he's, he's leading that team. He's also working with Cal IT Squared now to then say, okay, when we come in with what John Orcutt will talk about with RoadNet, or we're doing 500 um, pocket PCs on campus like we are here with the, the freshmen in computer science, or we're putting up the bridges with instruments. All these wireless networks go into this uh, uh, common distributed data system. And so that allows for what we normally think of, and I picked this picture intentionally because it looks like the military, and of course that offends everybody and academia and says, we don't do that, they do that off behind those barbed wires and everything. This is what we are building in this university to do basic research in science. Because if you are going to do the sort of thing that John Orcutt is talking about, in which you have vast amount of data coming from the oceans, from the environment, uh, from transportation systems, and you want to study that and be able to bore down to the details and yet also see the emergent large-scale structure, to be having the sort of thing that is called situational awareness, to understand uh, 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 how to build out of the data knowledge, these kind of... Uh, systems uh, are going to be absolutely necessary and they've got to be linked by fiber optics to other systems so that scientists all over the place at different universities can collaboratively work on things because as you get to this level of detail of data it's no longer a single discipline. If you've got that much data you've got a whole bunch 
of disciplines. And therefore, it's not one professor. It's got to be a whole bunch of professors. And your university, probably as good as UCSD is, Bob, isn't going to have everybody you need. And so you have to go out and bring them together wherever they are. And that changes as virtual teams, virtual organizations. So these technologies, I think, give a whole new meaning to dual use uh, as we think about uh, homeland uh, security, um, think about emergency preparedness, and we think about scientific research in an era of massive sensor nets. Thank you.